Chapter Seven of Mystery at Number Six. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Mystery at Number Six by Augusta Hugh Seaman. Chapter Seven. Revelation. After it was all over. Bernice thought it the strangest afternoon she had ever spent, but at the time her mind was so much occupied with other things that she never realized how the hours went. Sydney drove them to the little roadside store five miles away, a wee little place where the cheap commodity for sale seemed to be ginger ale and other liquid refreshments of a like nature. As in a dream, she watched Delight make her simple purchases, and then they started to drive back. But if I get back and go home so soon, commented Delight, they'll wonder how it has happened. It takes a long time to walk that ten miles. They will not like it if they know I have ridden with you, with anyone. Oh, that's simple, Sydney laughed. If that's the case, We'll take a good long drive and land you back home about the time you'd naturally arrive there. So much the better. You just drive ahead then and don't pay any attention to us. We're talking, commanded Bernice, in a significant tone. And Sidney, quick to take the hint, devoted himself exclusively to the wheel, while the two girls snuggled down in the back seat remained absolutely oblivious of all outward affairs. It was a long story that Delight told, partly in the cracker, patois, that she naturally used, partly in the simple but laboured good English that she sometimes tried to affect. The substance of it, as Bernice afterward retailed it to Sydney, was as follows. She had always lived in the Everglades, as far as she knew or could remember, in the very depths of them for the greater part of her life. Whether she was born there or not, she did not know. She had always been with Jerry and his Indian wife, Wanaka. Wanaka had been very good to her, very kind and loving. In fact, both of them were. The first camp or home she remembered was on a hammock or wooded knoll in the glades near the region of Fort Myers, but even that town was many miles away across the big cypress swamp. Jerry used to go for supplies occasionally in his canoe. He got Wanaka anything she wanted. He even brought her at one time a little hand sewing machine, and the Indian woman made many pretty things with it for her to wear. The girl declared that she was very happy at this period. She loved the wilds and knew no other kind of life. Later Jerry decided to go to another region, and they moved the camp to the north side of the glades. There were many other moves sometimes near the Miami region, sometimes on the west side. Always they kept well within the glades. In the main it was always Jerry who went out to the towns, though occasionally Wanaka went. Jerry often acted as guide to some tourist who wanted to make a trip into the glades. Sometimes it would be just for hunting or trapping. Sometimes a man would take an exploring expedition through them. Jerry knew them as no one but the Indians knew them. At this point Bernice had inquired, not without some trepidation, whether Jerry himself was partly Indian, as it had been rumoured. Delight replied that he had once said he thought he was part Indian, but neither his father nor mother was an Indian. They were both native Floridians from somewhere near Fort Myers. His real name was not Sawgrass but Simpson. The former had been given him as a joke by the first person he ever guided through the glades. These wilds are overgrown with the terrible tall grass, 
with edges as sharp as a knife or saw, called sawgrass. It was almost impossible to cut one's way through it. Jerry was so expert at overcoming this difficulty that the man had nicknamed him Jerry Sawgrass, and he had kept the name to this day. But he had once been told that one of his grandparents was a Seminole Indian, and he thought it was his Indian inheritance that made him love the glade so much. He preferred to live in them and was very fond of his Indian wife. She was a real Seminole. It was a long time before Delight ever thought of asking any questions about herself. She never dreamed there was anything to ask. Jerry and Wanaka were as her father and mother to her. She had never known any other, and as she almost never saw any one else, there were no questions in her mind. She was happy, that was enough. But when she was about eleven or twelve years old, a strange thing happened. They had just come to live near Fort Lauderdale, and were camped on the New River several miles inland from the town. She had gone out one morning to roam in the woods, but came back after a while, and lay down in the sun close to the back of the hut. She had almost fallen asleep when she heard the two talking inside the hut. They evidently thought she was still away, for, as she listened, because she had nothing else to do, and could not very well avoid it, she heard Wanaka ask Jerry if she might take Delight into town with her the next day. He replied a trifle angrily, No, 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 now, don't begin that. You know what the understanding was. She's not to go near people. It'll be the beginning of trouble. She's getting older now, and will begin to understand and ask questions. It won't do, I tell you. He gave strict orders, and won't have em disobeyed. Instant wonder sprung up in the mind of delight. What was it all about? She could not think. She had never dreamed there was any mystery about her. Who was it that did not wish her to see people, and why? She lay very still and listened longer, hoping she might hear something else. They were quiet a long time. Jerry was mending a fishing rod, and Wanaka was putting things away in the hut. She liked to keep it tidy. They had not been there very long and things were not in their right places yet. Presently she heard Wanaka ask Jerry, Where shall I put this? Here, give it to me. It's time that thing was destroyed. She might get hold of it some time. She can't read, but it might make her curious. I'll burn it. She heard him answer, and then there was a sound of tearing, as if a book had been ripped to pieces. Nothing else happened, and after a while they both went out to fish in the river, farther upstream. Neither one had seen her. It was then that she stole into the hut and looked in the fireplace. The fire had gone out. There was a considerable pile of ashes and the stiff covers of a book that had charred but not burned up. On one of the covers was a word or two in printing. She did not know what it was. She had never seen any books and very few printed words, only those on the canned goods and things that Jerry brought home from the towns. But something in her mind told her it meant something, and she saved it. Then she poked around in the ashes and presently found in the heap several pieces of paper that had not all been burned but only charred around the edges and on these were strange marks not much like the printing on the book cover and yet not entirely unlike them she did not then know it was handwriting but the same feeling made her sure that this too was something which if she could find out what it meant would help her to make something out of this strange new puzzle. 
She took the papers, all that had enough left on them to be worth saving, and hid them away in a safe, dry place, far off from the hut. She never mentioned to the others what she had discovered, and they never knew. But from that moment she felt that she could not rest till she had learned how to read, how to puzzle out all that was on those papers. She thought and thought of how it could be done. Jerry would not allow her to go into town and go to school. She knew that without even asking. Neither he nor Wanaka knew how to read. How was she to begin? In looking about the house she saw, however, that many things there had labels with marks, and, guessing that those marks or words told what they were, she decided to begin right there. She took the cans of things whose contents she knew, and tried to remember the marks that evidently meant those words. Very soon she knew the combination of marks that meant tea, sugar, flour, and the words of that sort. Many times she met with words she could not connect with anything at all, and often made mistakes and got them connected with the wrong things. But she learned a little in that way. Then one time when Jerry and Wanaka had both gone into town, they came back with a magazine that Wanaka had bought because she liked to look at the pretty pictures and Wanaka had insisted on getting for her a little child's book full of bright coloured pictures that she thought the girl would like to see. Neither of them realised it, because they could not read and did not even want to, but this little book was a child's easy primer, full of pictures that illustrated the simple words of sentences so that one could not help learning something from it, especially if one was interested and trying hard as she was. After a while she had learned all she could from the primer, and she had saved the magazine that Wanaka had thrown away when she was tired of it. She knew now a fair number of words whenever she saw them, but she never found anything like what was on the cover of the burned book, nor in the least like the marks on the paper or leaves. She was not satisfied and was really quite unhappy, because she could not make any more progress. Then Jerry agreed to go with a man who was anxious to spend a while in the glades, exploring or doing scientific work and wanted a guide and companion. They were to be gone five or six months, and he left Wanaka and herself to remain where they were till he got back. After he had gone, she paddled the canoe down toward the town one day and discovered, on the bank of the river, before one gets into Fort Lauderdale, a little house where there seemed to be a number of children sitting in rows and learning what she almost jumped out of her skin to find was some of the very words she knew. She realized then that this was a school. She had sometimes heard Jerry speak of it near the town. A pretty young woman was sitting on a raised platform and telling the children the words. Delight never knew how she came to do it, but she got out of the canoe walked right into the room and up to the young woman, and asked if she could go to school there. The woman looked rather surprised, but said, Of course, dear, sit down over there, and I'll find out presently what you know. She found out later that the girl knew very little, except the words she had taught herself, but she was so desirous to learn that she seemed to pick knowledge up very quickly. The teacher did not ask her too many questions, for she thought the child was one of the Indians who often came down the river to the town. Some of them would occasionally ask to be allowed to go to school for a while, and the white people were always very willing to have them, and never asked them many questions for fear they might become frightened or embarrassed, 
and might never come back any more. Delight went back to Wanika that day, and told her what she had done, and Wanika was very angry about it at first. But the girl begged hard and said she wanted to learn to read so that she could amuse herself, and promised to read interesting stories to Wanika when she could do so, so that finally the Indian woman gave way, said she might go, and promised not to tell Jerry, who would punish her severely if he knew. She made her promise faithfully, however, that she would not have anything to do with the other children, and would come straight back every day when school was over and that she would not tell the teacher anything about themselves or their lives. She went to school for more than five months, and in that time learned to read and write, not very well, but to some extent, and a little of other subjects. The teacher said she picked things up with amazing quickness, but this was because she was determined to learn all she could in the short time she had. The teacher used to teach her in extra times like recesses, when she saw she did not play with the others out of doors. Sometimes she stayed after school was over, and gave her extra help, and frequently lent her books to read at home. She was very, very kind, and Delight became quite fond of her. Only once did she ask anything about the girl herself. She put her arms about Delight one day, and asked how it was that her eyes were so blue, that she did not seem like an Indian. Delight could not answer her, and as she saw that the girl was embarrassed, she did not insist on an answer, and never asked her anything of that kind again. Jerry came back at the time he had said he would, and she dared not go to school any more. She was very sorry, but, at least, she had done what she wished. She had learned to read and write. She was content. They only stayed at that place a short time afterward, for one day Jerry came back from the town upset about something, though he did not say what had disturbed him. They never knew, but in a day or two they had packed all their things up again, and were off for another move. They went far into the glades this time, and stayed there, longer than they had ever stayed so far in before. It seemed almost as if Jerry was afraid to come out, for some reason. At last, as their supplies had given out, and they needed to move nearer to a town, they went up to the northern part, near Okeechobee, it was here that Wanika became very ill. They never could tell what it was, but thought she had eaten something poisonous without knowing it. They could do nothing for her, and could not get a doctor, though Jerry tried, but could find none who would come. She died the day he returned, and they buried her there near the lake. It was plainly an effort for delight to go over this part of her history, and she stopped for a few moments to wink away the tears. But presently she went on. We felt very bad and very lonely after that, Uncle Jerry and I. He has never seen the same since. He never talked very much, but since then he has been so silent. He scarcely ever speaks at all only when he's spoken to or asked a question and must answer. Uncle Jerry and I went to stay with Wanika's people, the Seminole Indians, for a while. I did not know their language and couldn't talk to them much, but they were good to us and very kind to me. So the time passed till a few months ago Uncle Jerry began to be ill in some way and he thought that the Glades did not agree with him any more, that he would not be well again while he lived in them. He left me with the Seminoles, and he went and saw some of his own people that he had not seen for years. 
He went several times, but he did not take me with him. At last one day he came back and told me he had married again, a cracker woman he had met while he was visiting his people. He said she would be good to me and help take care of me, and that we were going to go further north, away from the glades altogether, to live. He thought it would be better for his health. So we came up here. It is a great change, and I miss the glades very much. Uncle Jerry found he could rent that old house, way off from everything, and it just suited him. He thought no one would know him around here, but I think he is mistaken about that. He has been recognized several times. It has upset him. The, his new wife, is kind enough to me, but somehow I can't like her very much. She's very careless, not tidy about things like Wanaka was. And she takes snuff, and it makes her lazy. She never wants to move about much. She's not unkind to me, but, but I think she does not care very much about me, and I can't seem to care for her. They still don't wish me to see anyone or, or go anywhere. Today is very unusual that I should have been allowed to go for these things. It is only because Uncle Jerry couldn't go, and she wouldn't. That is all. She ended the tale so suddenly that Bernice was startled. But, Delight, she exclaimed, you have not told me what you found out about those papers you were so anxious to read. Did they tell you anything? What was it? They told me something, but they are very hard to read. I don't understand them, the girl answered. They only made the mystery greater. Here they are. I always carry them about with me hidden. You can look at them for yourself. She took a small packet from inside her blouse and thrust it into her companion's hands. End of chapter 7